I'll start off by saying a big thank you to the uh, Globe and, and all of the people that are attending this morning uh, and those that are viewing this uh, virtually. Uh, I'll start off by acknowledging that we're here gathered on the traditional territory of the uh, Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish nations. I want to recognize my colleague, Minister George Heyman, uh, who is here, Minister for Environment and Climate Change Strategy. Uh, and, uh, and it's lovely to be here with Premier Horgan and, uh, and my good friend, Professor Mariana Mazzucato, who's on the, on, on the screen. I'll just uh, start by sharing with everyone that it's been, uh, it's been a very challenging last two years. Uh, we know with uh, the pandemic, uh, the fires, the floods, the heat domes, uh, that we've all been through a very traumatic experience. Uh, and, uh, and partly for us as a province, the work we've been doing is saying, how do we take all the lessons we've learned from all these challenges we've faced and ensure that we're more resilient as we go forward. And that's the main focus of our Stronger BC Economic Plan. Our plan was about taking the lessons learned and making sure that we're positioning our economy in a way that we can both address those challenges, but also see growth. And the plan is uh, focused on two key priorities, which is uh, inclusive growth and clean growth. Uh, and of course, uh, we're gonna jump into a little bit more about that, but uh, I'll introduce my first guest, uh, I don't think it needs much of an introduction, but we've got uh, uh, Premier uh, John Horgan. Uh, and our guest who on the screen is uh, beaming in from the UK is uh, Professor Mariana Mazzucato, who is, um, if I read her entire bio, uh, it'll take up the entire 28 minutes, but I won't. But I'll just say that she's the founder of the Institute of Innovation and Public Purpose at the University College of London. Uh, and I am so delighted to have her as a special advisor and sharing uh, all her knowledge with us here in British Columbia. Uh, I do want to congratulate her and I say a big thank you to her uh, for uh, the report which she is launching this afternoon, which is going to be called The Inclusive and Sustainable British Columbia, a mission-oriented approach to a renewed economy, which will help us advance our stronger BC economic plan and give us a pathway forward to ensure that we can see the type of growth that we want to see here here in British Columbia. So we will now dive into, the, into a bit of a Q&A and, um, uh, and I'll start with the Premier because uh, I know that when we had the conversation about what our economic plan will look like when we go forward, uh, we, we definitely knew it was gonna be different, but certainly this economic plan is different than many, in fact, all economic plans that we've seen in British Columbia where we've talked about a whole host of things, uh, childcare and housing and et cetera. And so, Premier, maybe you can share some of your thoughts on, uh, on this economic plan compared to what we've done in the past. Well, sure, Ravi, thank you very much for that. And uh, Dr. Mezzucato, it's good to see you even uh, on a screen. Uh, it is uh, great to be in a room filled with people uh, that have a common purpose to understand and focus on what our future is going to be and then shaping that future. And as Ravi said, when we, uh, of course, we came out of uh, a fire season into a flood season and then another fire season and then before we could get into the flood season, we were into the pandemic. And so uh, I don't need to tell anyone in this room or anyone who's uh, participating virtually what the past couple of years have been uh, for people here in BC and indeed around the world. But the advantage for Ravi and I in government was that we were able to uh, stay in place. Traveling was no longer uh, uh, what was part and parcel of our craft as uh, elected representatives. We were able to engage with people virtually, which of course spurred the need to connect all of British Columbia. So we have uh, initiated over the past uh, number of months uh, uh, a province-wide connectivity agenda that will connect every community in British Columbia so that we can benefit from the time we've had over the past two years to uh, hone this technology and utilize it for economic activity, social activity, and indeed in some instances, cultural activities. Uh, so connectivity is key to that. And, and when we talk about clean growth, uh, that has been uh, the driving force of the governments of British Columbia for some decades now. This is not a partisan issue. The good news in BC is that all uh, political perspectives understand and recognize that in a carbon constrained environment, we need to be innovative, we need to be dynamic. So for us, it's not just about clean growth, it's about inclusive growth as well. What we learned through the pandemic, as Ravi, you know full well, having tasked you with taking these, this, this job on, is that although we have been in the same storm, we have not all been in the same canoe. 
And we need to continue to paddle together, but we need to ensure that we're lifting everyone at the same time. And historically, uh, economic plans in British Columbia have focused almost exclusively on our resource base. We have uh, ab absolute uh, extraordinary uh, resources in British Columbia. They're diverse. Uh, they're needed around the world. But we also have uh, a life sciences sector that is transforming uh, health care for people not just here in, in Canada, but indeed around the world. Uh, our quantum computing technologies, our, our universities expanding our STEM seats is something I see uh, Professor uh, Petter in the crowd who uh, every time I see Andrew, he tells me we need more spaces, we need more spaces. That's part of the plan. We need to train the next generation of innovators and we do that in our <laughs> uh, uh, thunderous applause from, uh, from uh, Dr. Petter. But, but this is the future, ensuring that we are uh, in lifting everyone up, giving people the tools they need to succeed and for our economy to grow and be dynamic in a carbon constrained environment. Yeah, and uh, an exciting clean tech sector that we have here, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and I know that we'll be talking a lot more about that a little bit later. Uh, and I'll go to Professor Mazzucato. Uh, you know, of course, you've got experience working with so many jurisdictions around the world. Uh, perhaps you can share some thoughts with us on uh, both some of the challenges and opportunities that we may face when we're talking about having uh, clean and inclusive growth here in British Columbia. Sure. So first of all, it's, it's wonderful to be with you both. And last time that Premier Horgan and I were on screen, we ended up boring you all because we talked about lacrosse. We will not do that this time. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, what I have found so interesting in terms of also working with your team is, first of all, how open you've been to really kind of rethink some of the tools that we sometimes just take for granted, say an industrial strategy, and actually to transform it precisely in order to meet the goals that you have in your new economic strategy around inclusive growth and clean growth. Because I, I just want to go back to a point that uh, Premier Horgan made in terms of sectors, right? You know, resource-based sectors, life sciences sectors, digital and the tech sector, quantum computing, uh, you know, nutrition. Like, we could go through all our different sectors and unfortunately, often uh, countries, when they think about their industrial strategies, will make like a list of their top sectors and then maybe brag about how well they're doing. And we've tried to reverse that with your team which is to say, what are your goals? And then what can be done to make sure that all your different sectors, and Premier Horgan just listed some of them, can really become part of the solution, also in terms of how they work together, but also how they transform themselves. Mm -hmm. So um, Minister Champagne talked about the decarbonization of steel. I found really interesting that in Germany, for example, the decarbonization of steel didn't just happen because someone said it was gonna happen. It actually happened because there was conditions built into the loans that were provided by the uh, German public bank in terms of what had to be done in the steel industry in order to receive that loan. Mm -hmm. Now, they ended up decarbonizing, lowering their material content in the way they decided to do, so there was no micromanaging, but the fact they did it was important, and it wouldn't have happened had there just been an industrial strategy saying we're gonna be doing great steel. So actually having you know, the German Energy Wende or your clean growth strategy to really provide a vision, a focus in terms of what it then means to transform all the different instruments, whether it's procurement, whether it's budgeting, whether it's an industrial strategy, an innovation strategy to meet those goals, that's really the journey that we've been on with you. And a really key point there is really to kind of debunk this old myth that you have economic strategy here and then kind of societal and social concerns there. So how to actually use a mission-oriented approach that's focused on very concrete goals like you know, a carbon-neutral city or globally a plastic-free ocean and actually aligning the different instruments and creating a really dynamic innovation system where then the economic growth and the increase in productivity are outcomes of that. Because what I found globally is that when we just focus on these things like economic growth or productivity or having a startup community as an end in itself, ironically doesn't actually then produce that growth in the same way that the moon landing pr produced lots of you know, commercialization opportunities on Earth around camera phones, foil blankets, software, not because they focus on those technologies, but because each and every one of those technologies were solutions to problems that had to be solved along the way. And so your own challenges around inequality, because unfortunately BC does have one of the highest levels after Ontario of inequality, issues around structural racism with the indigenous community, issues around climate change that you both spoke about, fires, floods, the heat dome, 
all these can be really used to focus our minds on key problems that have to be solved in an intersectoral way and an all of government approach, redesigning our tools to actually focus on the problems. And, and Dr. Moscato, the, the challenge you raise is also a strength for us, the, the diversity of British Columbia. We are citizens of the world, a, 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 a vibrant indigenous uh, community, 204 nations across the province. People from around the world make up the rest of the population. And that is a key strength, but one that needs to be nurtured and cared for and part of our strategy going forward. How do we all work together to get our common purposes realized? And, and so we're trying to, as you, you said, flip some of these things on their head. We've had the time to do that as a result of the pandemic, to look at uh, other jurisdictions, to look at the work that you and others have been doing and incorporate that into government thinking, which, uh, you know, in, in defense of previous governments, they haven't had that, that rest period, if I could call a global pandemic a rest period, to, to start to rethink how we look at the world and how are we going to come out of this transformative period. That's a, it's a real opportunity. And I think instead of uh, instead of focusing on the challenges, we've turned them upside down and called them opportunities. And that may Absolutely. sound like jargon to some, but it's in, in fact what I think the public expect of us and, and uh, over time will demand of other ju jurisdictions as well. Yeah, no, and uh, I think uh, the, the points are fantastic. And, and thank you for mentioning Minister Champagne because uh, he's been a, um, a fireball of energy and uh, certainly we're going to need him uh, and, uh, and the federal government's support to ensure that the plan and the vision that we're working on together uh, can be enacted. We're going to need their support. I know we've got their support, so I want to thank Minister Champagne. But this idea uh, that both of you have highlighted around um, having inclusive and uh, clean growth at the core of the plan as opposed to dealing with it after the fact I think is vitally important and uh, and I know with this plan uh, you know partly we're, we're talking about things that traditionally don't get discussed in economic plans uh, whether it's child care and housing and building resilient communities and uh, and premier I don't know if you want to share some additional thoughts on those measures well again um when we were in that interminable 12 miserable years of opposition, the good news about our adversarial system is that when you do have that reflective period of, uh, of throwing rocks at governments, you, you get an opportunity to talk to people about what their expectations are. And, and although I would never want to revisit or uh, wish upon anyone that length of time in opposition, it does allow you to think uh, outside of the day-to-day -day issues of managing government. And, and that's why I go, I go back to this notion that the pandemic allowed uh, government, the, the bureaucracy, the public service particularly, to look at the world in different ways. And instead of just inventorying our strengths, as Dr. Mazzucato said, the traditional approach, this is what we do, we do it well, pat us on the back. Instead, we said, what do we need to do better and how do we get to that place? And business after business said, we need more people in the workforce. Uh, child care is, a, a lack of child care is a disincentive to largely women to get back into the workforce. We need to take away those disincentives, remove barriers and make it easier for people to settle and engage in the economy. And, and the more people that are participating, the more equality we'll be able to achieve over time. But ha having those as the foundations of our plan, a labor market strategy that looks at skills training, uh, providing housing, which of course in a high cost jurisdiction like British Columbia is extremely challenging. Without these component parts, the sectors that we, we see thriving would not be able to continue to grow. So uh, my task to you, Ravi, was, and, and you're carrying it out uh, expertly, I, I might say, uh, is to incorporate all of these component parts that make a strong and robust community so that we can have a strong and robust economy, keeping in mind that inclusion is the key to success for everyone. If we're, not, if we're leaving anyone behind, in my opinion, that's a failure. And uh, there's no need for that in a, com in a community as dynamic as British Columbia with access to our post-secondary institutions that are second to none uh, and an entrepreneurial class that has managed to, uh, to not just uh, thrive but to, to to have uh, knock-on effects uh, as a result of the pandemic, our life sciences sec sector, the obvious one, because of the work at UBC and other places. So for me, uh, the task is making sure that we're pulling on uh, all of the strings together at the same time and, and having buy-in from community. And for the, for the industrial sector, uh, we're not leaving you behind, but you need to know that innovation is imperative to your survival. Mass timber is the key to success on our forest land base and, and also ensuring that Indigenous peoples uh, have full participation in economic activity on their territory. 
All of that is imperative, and there's buy-in from industry, there's buy-in from communities, there's buy-in from workers. So uh, th these, found, these pillars are in place, now we just have to implement. And, and that, uh, of course, includes a global marketplace that we have to be attuned to as well. We can't uh, do all of this in isolation. We have to do it while we're still being the gateway to uh, the Asia-Pacific, uh, which uh, is a, an, an extraordinary advantage to us here in British Columbia and Prince Rupert and in Vancouver, but also the gateway to North America for those products and services that are coming here. And so British Columbia stands, uh, in my opinion, in a unique position, but we need to make sure we play our strengths and we acknowledge our weaknesses and we, and we take our strengths to build on our weaknesses. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Premier. And uh, I'll, I'll jump back to you, Professor Mazzucato, around uh, uh, perhaps you can share, uh, if we step back a second and, uh, and maybe foreshadowing a little bit around the report, um, you know, you, can you outline maybe a few examples of how we can both increase productivity uh, while reducing inequality and tackling climate change? Sure. And maybe I can just um, start with a concept that was just put on the table, which is entrepreneurship. And I think what's central is to use that word to describe the whole system. How can we build an entrepreneurial system throughout British Columbia? And that really means that all the different tools that governments have at their disposal, whether it's public procurement, uh, budgeting, the ways we evaluate public investment, so evaluation tools, uh, new types of public finance, like you have your new NBC, a public bank, how they can all become levers, entrepreneurial levers that really catalyze change, create additionality. In other words, making things happen that would not have happened otherwise. The last thing you want is a policy that's just kind of, you know, taking the place of something else and or just giving out money, guarantees and subsidies for allowing also inertia and the status quo to remain. So just some examples, maybe four quickly. One, I'm, I'm kind of a, become a geek around procurement because every country, even those that have limited budgets or think they have limited budgets, have a procurement budget. And really using that as part of an innovation budget, instead of seeing, again, innovation in one you know, section of the room and then tools like procurement in another, using all the different tools, including procurement, to become levers for innovation is something that needs to happen with a bit of a mind shift. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. In Sweden, they have this very high-level challenge of having a fossil-free welfare state, but then this lands on the very particular, like school meals, right? School lunches have to be, in Sweden, in order to foster their fossil-free welfare state, um, healthy, tasty, so not just IKEA meatballs, and sustainable. So the fact that there's a real target, um, a goal, with something as simple as school lunch, which of course is all over the country means that then the procuring in of that lunch becomes part of the sustainability strategy. And it becomes part of the innovation plan because, of course, in order to meet the sustainability target, you need to innovate, you need to invest, you need to do things differently. Another really interesting thing about that um, particular policy is that they've involved school children. So this issue of participation and co-creation has to be real. It can't be tokenistic. And so kids are actually learning about sustainability through their school lunches, through the curriculum, and also have an opportunity in some schools to participate in the design of those lunches. So really, you know, bringing that issue of participation, co-creation, co-design to the table is also really interesting. But the public procurement budget used as part of the innovation budget around very concrete goals, but leaving open the how and crowding in the willing. You might have heard, you know, some concepts like picking winners is sometimes uh, talked about as problematic because we're picking sectors or technologies ex ante that then don't meet our expectations. But we need to transform that to pick those who are willing, not picking winners, picking the willing. So all those different organizations that are willing to move with you in the direction of a cleaner, more inclusive economy and using that lever. Quickly, some of the other ones, because I took too long on that one. How do we evaluate <clears throat> these policies that are mission-oriented, that are challenge-oriented around goals? Well, it can't just be through cost-benefit analysis and net present value. It can't just be by asking which market failure did we fix, the old questions. We need tools that are much more dynamic than that. I mentioned before the moon landing. That required so many different sectors, and a lot of the innovations that occurred along the way happened across many different sectors. How do we capture, through the, our evaluation methods, those dynamic spillovers? Um, because that should be, even in the cases where we don't meet the mission right away, the process through which we try to do so 
if it can catalyze new forms of collaborations across different sectors, that should be seen as part of the success or the failure to do that. Third, public finance. You know, there's plenty of finance globally. There's no finance problem in terms of quantity. We often don't have the right quality. There's not enough patient, long-term committed finance. So you've now set up an NBC public finance fund. Um, we need to make sure that that fund isn't, again, just handing out money to sectors that lobby their way up the list of being seen as priority sectors, but really that it's used to crowd in and provide that patient long-term finance to those organizations willing to move with you, again, in that direction. And that means, as I mentioned before, in the case of Germany, conditionality linked to the loans, but also measures to make sure that you really are catalyzing and creating that additionality between different uh, uh, types of organizations in the economy. And lastly, just building on um, Premier Horgan's point about indigenous people, you know, we can talk about co-creation and stakeholder engagement, but it's often unfortunately done in a tokenistic way. So I think it's really important to, to take seriously what Premier Horgan talked about, which is bringing different voices to the table ex ante, not just asking people or telling them that it's going to be good for different communities or you know, asking them ex post, what did you think, how did it go, really bringing different voices together, even to debate and to have sometimes uncomfortable um, discussions about what it actually means to live together in a more sustainable and inclusive way. And I think, you know, given how seriously I think you're taking this challenge and this opportunity, uh, it will be very important to also focus on social innovations, not just technological innovations, to create those kind of citizen assemblies and discussions that might be uncomfortable, but are very needed in order to get things right so they're good for people. Uh, I just need to say that uh, Dr. Mazzucato and I didn't just talk about lacrosse. Every time we get to engage, you can see how... Uh, how provocative she is and how uh, stimulating it is to hear her. And, and you touched on a, a half a dozen things. I, I, I'm going to knock you off your script. Uh, <laughs> firstly, on the procurement side, th these are fundamental issues. And I know uh, it's not the usual talk uh, around the think tanks. What are we going to do about procurement? Uh, opening up government expenditures to small and medium enterprises allows them to scale up. If we just let the biggest uh, dog in the room have all of the uh, government procurement, then we're not building up these new and innovative, uh, tra transformative, transformative uh, industries or companies within our within our ecosystem. Similarly, um, the uh, the strain on our supply chains as a result of the pandemic, as a result of the atmospheric river highlighted the imperative of agri-tech in our agricultural sector. And we have a, a, extraordinary potential here because of the far-sighted view of former politicians to create an, an agricultural land reserve. We now need to use that reserve not just to bank the land for some time in the future, but to use it today to feed not just British Columbians, but indeed uh, our surrounding communities. These are innovations that are a result of the trauma of the past couple of years. And on um, procurement as basic as public infrastructure, we put in place a thing called community benefit agreements that ensure that if you get a contract to build something, it's a bridge, a school, a hospital, we get that public asset as a result of the public expenditure, but you're required to have a fixed number of apprentices that are indigenous, women, people of color, so that we are inclusive in our growth, training the next generation of workers, skilled workers, to meet the challenges. That's the power of government. We shouldn't fritter it away on uh, lowest cost bid and these other things. We need to get more out of our dollars than just the end product. That's the innovation and transformation that missions allow us to do. What are our multiple purposes in expending that dollar on your behalf? And Dr. Mazzucato's uh, approach to this has shaped how we're going to go forward. And it's very exciting. And uh, I know, again, uh, procurement usually has people nodding off at the cabinet table. Uh, Ravi's not one of them, but uh, for many, it's, oh, yeah, 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 someone else is dealing with that. But, uh, and the expenditure of a public dollar has a benefit to all of us if we, if we do it correctly. If we're just throwing them out the door to meet an objective, then we're failing, I think, in the long term.
Yeah. Th thanks for that. Thanks to both of you because that's that's uh, bang on on the things that we need to focus on as we move forward. Um, I just I do want to touch on two points. One, uh, thank you, Professor Mazzucato, on your support with NBC. Uh, we are so excited about our uh, new half a billion dollar strategic investment fund, uh, which uh, will help provide patient capital to address the challenges that we want to address. Uh, and I know that you've been instrumental in supporting that. And and yesterday the premier uh, launched uh, with Indigenous. Uh, leaders, our uh, Reconciliation Action Plan, which is uh, the next steps co-developed on how we address uh, both uh, wellness and economic opportunities with Indigenous communities, but address the historical wrongs, and I think that was an exciting moment for all of us. Now, we have uh, uh, just a few more minutes left, so um, perhaps we can uh, maybe give each of you a couple minutes just to share uh, some wrap-up, some takeaways from the Stronger BC Economic Plan, uh, things that, that are highlighted and key that you think are important for us to share with the audience here today. Uh, I'll start with you, Premier. Well, I, I would say that I think delegates would agree that uh, another two Two hours with Dr. Mazzucato would be a great benefit to Globe uh, this year, uh, but uh, it is uh, always uh, uh, illustrative, I think, for policymakers to, to engage with people who want to get you out of a box. And historically, governments tend to follow patterns uh, over time. You're elected with a with a dynamic uh, platform that is created with the view of forming a government and doing good deeds and creating a better world but you get caught up in the mundane after a time. And, and I think it's important for policymakers to always reject conventional wisdom and look at how we can build a better, stronger, more inclusive society with all of the constraints that this room knows full well. Uh, as we transform our energy sectors, our buildings, our transportation infrastructure and networks, we need to do it with a view to making sure there's maximum benefit to all British Columbians. And I'm very excited about the challenges ahead because of the, uh, the people in this room and, and the innovative and entrepreneurial uh, class we have in, in British Columbia. Uh, we have uh, extraordinary potential at our fingertips, but we all need to be focused on doing this in a way that benefits everybody, not just a select few. And, and uh, I'm very excited about the work that Ravi and uh, his team and with Dr. Mazzucato and others have put together with our Stronger BC uh, economic plan, and, and it is a plan that's, that's not uh, garden variety. It will not be like uh, plans from previous governments in British Columbia, because we acknowledge we have uh, we have been hewers of wood and drawers of water uh, to good effect for some, but not for everyone, particularly Indigenous peoples. So the, uh, the work plan that we uh, laid out yesterday was not a plan from government to Indigenous communities. It was a plan built with Indigenous communities as part of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And we, British Columbians, are the only people on the planet to have embraced the declaration and now put in place a work plan to make it happen. And we didn't do it by ourselves. We did it together. That's how our economy will continue to grow. And that's how BC will prosper in a carbon-constrained environment with clean growth and inclusive growth. Here, here. Thank you uh, for that, Premier. Uh, Great comments, I appreciate it. Andrew did, <laughs> and, and more seats in universities there, Andrew. Uh, 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 over to you, Professor Mazzucato. Sure, I mean, maybe just at the risk of repeating myself, I'll say something a bit different yeah. <laughs> instead of summarizing. Um, one thing that neither of us touched on, but I know that we both uh, believe strongly in, is that none of this can be done without a stronger public sector. And stronger doesn't necessarily mean bigger. <laughs> it means more capable. So it's, it's quite extraordinary if you go to business schools and you look at the courses that managers and entrepreneurs take, you know, strategic management, decision sciences, organizational behavior, thinking creatively out of the box. Often we don't have that kind of ambition in the kind of training that we provide to the civil service itself. And we've gotten kind of stuck in this idea that at best the, the public service can fix different types of market failures. And you and I, Ravi, have talked a lot about this need for a market shaping, a market co-creating approach. Well, that requires specific types of training and skills within the civil service. So I really hope that you can accompany your BC economic plan, which is really, really inspirational. And as Premier Horgan said, driven by opportunities in the future, it needs to be accompanied also by an investment within and perhaps, you know, an investigation, or not investigation, that sounds criminal, uh, how, how can we say, <laughs> a plotting, a mapping of just how much has been outsourced, because this is really, you know, outsourced public capabilities to, whether it's consulting companies or other bits of the private sector, it's fine to do that a bit, but when we do it too much, we really rid the kind of, you know, 
needed learning by doing, trial and error and error, and that need to be creative and thinking out of the box in order to redesign procurement, do outcomes-oriented budgeting, have a dynamic mission-oriented public bank, so on and so forth. None of that can be done without the investment within our organizations. And um, yeah, I just you know, really welcome you to undergo that process because it's absolutely needed to go hand in hand with ambitious policies. Yeah, well, we certainly have a lot of work to do. Uh, you know, as, uh, as we've discussed, having a plan is the start uh, and doing the work uh, is gonna require lots of time and energy and, uh, and certainly we're all committed to that. Uh, with that, I wanna say a big thank you to you, Premier. I wanna say a big thank you to Professor Mazzucato and a big thank you thank to you. everyone here for being here this morning and, uh, and the Globe Conference has been a huge success. Maybe uh, just to wrap up, we can give a big applause to the, the organizers uh, who have done uh, just a fantastic job of this conference so a big thank you to everybody